Free Library of Philadelphia, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here to our Montgomery Auditorium and tonight's lecture with Beth Kephart and uh, Marsha Rose Shestak. So before um, I talk, uh, let's make sure our cell phones are silenced. And I want to remind you that no flash photography is, a, is permitted during tonight's event. And then, of course, as we always do, following the event, a book signing will take place upstairs in the lobby. And, and don't forget that most of our author events are also offered as podcasts at freelibrary.org if you've not taken advantage of that before. So the Free Library of Philadelphia is dedicated to advancing literacy, guiding learning, and inspiring curiosity throughout the city of Philadelphia through our 55 facilities. The library is a hallmark institution in this city, one of the things that makes Philadelphia so special. In just, a few, in just a few moments, we will hear from tonight's guest about what else makes Philadelphia so great. Um, so many of the library's most beloved programs and services are made possible only with the help of private support. A gift of whatever amount you are able to help, uh, able to make helps the free library transform lives. So please make your gift and help out the free library whenever you can online at freelibrary.org backslash support. So I had the opportunity to preview Beth's book, and, uh, and if those of you have a hard copy, you'll actually see my comments. But this is a beautiful um, literary piece, and I just want to read, you, read to you my comments um, after I was given the privilege of reviewing. <clears throat> Love is a lovely literary tour of places and spaces in and around Philadelphia. Kephart does a wonderful job of drawing you into her emotional connections to neighborhoods, to transportation routes, to some of the truly fascinating and iconic buildings around this ever-changing city, and to places that draw you outside of Philadelphia, but not so far that you cannot return quickly. Her lyrical prose instantly unites you with streets you've walked down before, but now with a bit more attention to details than you've ever considered. Even seen through Kephart's eyes and words, Philadelphia is a place of new beginnings. So it is now my pleasure to introduce, um, um, I, I jumped ahead, excuse me. Um, Beth Kephart describes herself, uh, her young self, as a child writer dreamer, and both her writing and her dreams have made her a Philadelphia success story. She is a National Book Award finalist, as well as an armchair BEA young adult novelist. With work spanning young adult fiction memoirs and Philadelphia history, it is clear her dreams have become a reality. By day, she runs a boutique marketing communications firm and teaches creative nonfiction at the University of Pennsylvania, where she received the 2015 Beltran Family Award for Innovative Teaching and Mentoring. In Love, a Philadelphia Affair, she shares a collection of Philadelphia-themed essays and photography, the collection, which can, which can be described as a love letter to Philadelphia's the region, its places, the people it touches, all corners of our city, and celebrates the unique touches, SEPTA, Reading Terminal, Independence Mall, that make this city of brotherly love our very own. She even devotes an essay to our very own author series. Um, Ms. Kephart will be interviewed tonight by broadcast journalist Marsha Rose Shestak, who has made who has also made her mark on Philadelphia. As a Penn doctoral student, as a reporter on our very own KYW, as a columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and as a member of our very own Pepper Society. In addition to her robust and noteworthy journalism career, she has been an award-winning talk show host and a docu documentary filmmaker. It is wonderful to have them both here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Beth Kephart and Marsha Rose Shestak to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Are you going to read yeah. first? Okay. We got a multi. I didn't get my signal. Event. <laughs> Thank you, Siobhan and Gary Kramer, wherever you are, who set this up, and Jason, and of course the great Marsha Rose, which soon we'll be sitting there chatting. I wrote an introduction to this evening's um, event. It's just for you. And then I will be reading one short chapter from the book. Thank all of you who have come here tonight. I know it's not easy to step inside on a glorious October day, um, but you have to know how much it means to me to have you here, so thank you. 
So, love was there from the start. The tick throb tick inside my first memories of Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia, my mother's childhood home. Margaret D'Imperio and Daniel D'Imperio had bought the house for 3390 back on June 13, 1942, putting $690 cash down toward their dream. They'd moved a big desk into the basement, hung a painting of a girl with county fair braids in the stairwell, unrolled a carpet, put some music on, and danced. By the time I came along, my grandmother's out-of-fashion hats and dresses had been stowed, along with my mother's report cards and uncle's Hollywood scrapbooks, in the basement alcove by the big desk. It was all treasure. There was the fade of the Charleston dance in the upstairs carpet. There was a TV in the sunroom where Ed Sullivan delivered. There were Easter baskets with mystery gifts attached to colored strings. There was a place for me to sit by the back door to watch the kids across the alley glisten with sun, to play with the cats that came, and to talk to Grandma. Love, it had a Philadelphia address, 6840 Geyer Avenue. But love lived, too, in the homes my parents built for me and my two siblings, first on the outskirts of Wilmington, Delaware, where my father, who is here tonight, uh, worked in an oil refinery, and then in Radnor, PA, after he'd taken a corporate job. Love lived as well at the Jersey Shore at Stone Harbor, where my father taught us how to dig for clams with our toes, and where we waited in sunburnt lines for our cones of blackberry ice cream, or in my father's case, mint chocolate chip. Love was my mother, stylishly clothed by the golden eagle of John Wanamaker Department Store. We would enter through the Chestnut Street door. Her head tipped back and our eyes following hers up toward the wonderland of the blinking holiday show. Is it even possible to remember feeling love without also remembering the physical place in which the love unsutured our hearts? We feel because we are alive. We are alive because we feel, and we feel specifically. Love is what has happened to me when I have walked Philadelphia or traveled to places just outside its bounds, when I've walked John F. Kennedy Boulevard near midnight with my husband and two kids we just met talking Bruce Springsteen, when I've grown short to the height of the late summer blooms of Chanticleer Garden, when I've walked the boardwalk at the Schuylkill Banks, when I've taken a flight of stairs up and stopped and looked down on that polar bear dog running circles at the 25th and Spruce Street Parks, where I've watched the sudden spill of a bridal party through Rittenhouse Square, where I found my fragments of face in the fragments of Isaiah Zagar tiling just off south. When I've traveled to Beach Haven off season with my husband, when I've sat in the bowels of the Fairmount Waterworks with a rising generation of environmentalists, when I have crested through the student tide on Locust Walk at Penn, looking for the students of now and then, the young person I once was and the much older person I've become when I have stood right here on the stage, beneath this height, inside this depth, where, thanks to the sparked intelligence of Andy and Chabon and the library patrons, the celebrities of literature come to talk, and when sometimes I get to pretend that I am one of them. Love happens specifically. It is a noun, it is a verb. I refuse to be ashamed of my standing as a woman of high passion. Call me sentimental if you want. Call me and I'll take it alive. Philadelphia lives inside the novels I've written, the myths I've created, the stories I've sought. It adjusts, afflicts, adjudicates those I teach at Penn. It fuels my work and fuels my dreams. It was in West Philadelphia, on Poplar Street, on Camac, on Gaskell, once my home, but that makes me no expert. If you have lived here, walked here, loved here, then aren't you a Philadelphian too? Heart of our hearts, this city. So Love, a Philadelphia Affair is a collection of essays and photographs, and many but not all of these first appeared in the pages of the Philadelphia Choir, gratefully written at first at the invitation of Avery Rome, and then, I think I see him back there, I do, uh, for Kevin Ferris, who's become a great friend through all these essays. It became a book thanks to the Temple University Press team, editor Micah Kleit, marketing director Anne Marie Anderson, publicist extraordinaire Gary Kramer, and others. It has a beautiful back cover because Jack Ferguson, 
the CEO of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, and the Gloria Shaban, whom you just heard from, and the great Joan, Jane Golden of the Mural Arts Program took the time to be generous. Philadelphians do that for each other. And it's being launched here this evening with Marsha Rose because this beautiful lady, this pioneer of broadcast journalism, this Philadelphia icon, was my mother's friend, and now she's mine. She has an outdoor viewing room not far from here. She, like me, has watched this city become, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to read just one short piece, actually. I think it's the first piece I wrote for the Enquirer in this series. It is called Double Dipping. It's about Stone Harbor, and it goes like this, 800 words. In the same way that I believed in black raspberry ice cream, blue-fingered crab, and the pink sheen of a flipped shell, I believed as a kid in the Jersey Shore, specifically Stone Harbor. It possessed me, and I possessed it those two weeks of every year when our parents would pack the carooming Oldsmobile with suits, rafts, shovels, pails, rusty-bottomed beach chairs, crab traps, tangled reels, and, where there was still room, my brother, sister, and me. We were only ever a couple of hours away, a big bridge and a few small ones. My father drove the back roads, farm country. We kept our windows down. We smelled ripening peaches and reddening tomatoes and kerneled corn long before we smelled the salt of the sea. Do white pebble lawns have a smell? How about the shallow wells of seaside miniature golf courses or the clogged heads of outside shower stalls or the tall grass that survives the sway of the dunes? I was sure that they did, and I would be the first to call, I smell it, Stone Harbor, we're here. These were the big events. Digging for clams with our toes and tossing the thick meat to the sudden stuttering of gulls above. Inflating the rafts until our faces were red. Lying on our backs in tidal pools, collecting freckles. Trapping crabs in the bay. Walking the froth line of the beach with our favorite uncle, who would come for one day, his trousers rolled to just below his knees. Choosing restaurants on the nights my mother didn't cook and standing at the edge of the kitchen in the rented bungalow on the nights that she did, praying the newly imprisoned crabs, their claws and erectus, would not escape their boiling pots. On rented bikes with clanging baskets, we would make our way to town to spy on the hermit creatures with painted shells in the t-shirt store. In the morning, the sand of sleep still in our eyes, we'd wake to the donuts my father had scouted too glazed with a touch of cream for me. When it rained, we'd play games and listen to the pebbled yards washing clean. When the sun was too hot, we cinched in beneath the Kephart umbrella and half slept, half dreamed. On the best night of the whole two weeks, we'd climb back into our Oldsmobile and drive to the bright lights and carousel cries of Ocean City. Am I the only one who remembers the Caterpillar ride? Actually, I was taking a walk with a friend the other day, and she remembered the Caterpillar ride. I was so excited. The only one who remembers winning so big at ski ball that I emerged as a Springsteen-worthy queen. Writing this now, I sorely miss then. It was sun before we suspected sun's poison and sweets before we felt the need to punish ourselves for delicious things. At Stone Harbor, we did what we wanted to do, explored or swam or walked or carved sculptures in the sand. I don't suppose we learned a thing we'd later use in school, but we were never learning at the beach. We were storing up particles of our future selves. We were conjuring then so that we'd have then for now. And isn't that the point, indeed? When we find our mythic second home, that anywhere to which we longingly return in our imaginations until we can return for real. My stone harbor in August is perhaps his Poconos at dawn, or her rooftop beneath a sheet of stars, or his neighborhood pool after the dinner hour when all but the most sweetly chlorinated have gone home. My stone harbor is my nostalgia outside of me. Like all true fairy tales, it lives. After my teenage years, married a mother, the Jersey Shore was lost to me. My very beautiful and talented Salvadoran husband sitting right there preferred the high kick of the Pacific Ocean. And my father's beach had moved south to the Carolinas. My brother is the one who brought Stone Harbor back who began to rent a house just off 96th Street as the summer wound down to its end. 
Come for the day, he'd say, and I would, driving the highways because I couldn't find my father's back roads and singing radio songs with my son. In my middle age, I do not own buckets, rafts, beach chairs, or traps. I've forgotten how to dig clams with my toes. I stink at miniature golf, and my ski ball skills are rusty. But my brother and nephew have taught me the magic of beach bocce. And my niece talks about the books that she reads, and my sister-in-law allows her feet to be dug around and in between when they get in the way of a sand sculpture. In Stone Harbor, the summer ends, and I sit shielding my hair, face, and knees from the sun. I walk the frothy shore with my boy. I take a book, but I dream instead. At night, we head to Springer's homemade ice cream over on 3rd Avenue and stand in line with appealing crowd. I read every sumptuous flavor slowly, almond, amaretto, butterscotch, brickle, cease and desist, more Oreo, prohibition, tradition, Springer, chip, tea berry, and then I place my order. A double scoop of black raspberry, I'll say. No one's surprised. Some fairy tales do not tolerate deviations. So we're going to talk now. Nice. You know, I was thinking as, as I was listening to Beth that very often when I come here to events, and I come very often, the celebrated author's total presentation is reading from their book. And when that happens, I'm very dismayed because I didn't come here to have them re read from their book. I can read the book. I came to learn more about them and, and to find out what moves them and how, what influenced them. And I was thinking as I was listening to Beth reading how I don't feel that way about Beth Kephart at all because when she reads and as you hear her words, it's who she is and it's the influences that have shaped her and the things that she loves and the things that her amazing gift for observation uh, and then to distill that observation into wonderful words. So I'm glad you read. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're beside me. <laughs> um, you know, when most people write about love, they write about another person, right? Mm -hmm. But you have embraced a whole city. <laughs> And I wonder if you could love another city as much as you love Philadelphia? I think that's a beautiful question, Marsha Rose. And I think the answer is that my personal history is all bound up in this place. Um, I became who I am shaped by this place, by studying the river and writing about the river, by writing many novels that take place around here, um, by loving, um, you know, my, my husband and I met in this city, Memorial Hall, well, at Copelander Associates, but then uh, fell in love with him at Memorial Hall. Um, and so this is who I am. I, the city is embedded in me. I'm embedded in small ways in the city. Do I appreciate other cities? My goodness, there's nothing I like to do more than go see cities. You know, put me down in Florence, take me to San Francisco. I love Chicago, um, but where's home? Philadelphia. And you love it because it's home. I love it because it's home, and I am aware of its many flaws, just for the record. <laughs> We won't ask you what those yes, are. Yes, not right now. But let me ask: What are some just? What are some of your favorite places? Uh, well, you have to understand that that the book uh, touches upon best observations of many places and many things, but place is a very important thing, and it's a it's a combination of place and memory. So, what are they? I, Notice I didn't ask you what was your most favorite. I piece, know. That's the terrible question. <laughs> I have, I was a University of Pennsylvania student and I was a lonesome University of Pennsylvania student and I've become, oh, I see one of my students out there, um, <laughs> Sylvia, beautiful Sylvia. Um, and I've become quite comfortable there and unlonely as a teacher. So do I love the Penn campus? Do I love the approach to the Penn campus? Absolutely. What has defined me as a writer is probably the Schuylkill River. Um, 
of course, I wrote the book Flow, and that is where I imagined myself as the river, told the river story in the first person voice. And so I feel tremendous connection to that. I should say that as the lonesome pen student, I lived and survived by taking a long walk, perhaps two hours every day. I would go out into West Philly, I would walk to the Delaware River and back and whatever it was. So what I really love is walking the city. I feel less alone when I'm walking the city. And when we read your words, we walk with you. I mean, it, it, it is really quite amazing. Interesting when you talk about the University of Pennsylvania. In, in one of the pieces, you talked about how lonely you were and um, how it wasn't, you talked about it as a cape of loneliness and that it wasn't until you started teaching that you shed that loneliness. Yeah. Why? Because the exploration that I have with my students is alive and unpredictable and honest and we build in our little room there uh, a community that lasts. Um, I leave the classroom full of respect for the young hearts and the young minds that I have the privilege to encounter. And when you're that engaged in a community, you cannot be lonely. Do you think that that loneliness added to your appreciation of things around you, that that, that, that shaped some of it? I think every writer uh, is in some way incomplete. And what I is the word? Incomplete. Incomplete. And so I think we're constantly striving uh, to, to fill pieces of ourselves in. I do that with movement and with language. And um, so, yeah, I think that that sense of loneliness shaped me. Where do we get a sense of loneliness? I'm not sure. I think in my case, uh, it's a sense of never knowing enough, never being enough, never quite achieving what I've wanted to achieve. So it's not something external. I have a lot of friends and a wonderful family, but it's a sense within myself of, hmm, not there yet, and there's a loneliness in feeling that way. That's, that's, that's interesting. I want to know how you write. I mean, do you, is it, um, so often there is a quality of your writing that's almost like stream of consciousness. So mm. I'm wondering if you, if you just write or if you rewrite or if it's painful or if it's effortless. <laughs> I want to know about the process. How many writers are out there? How painful is it? How many writers are out there finding it painful to be a writer? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, uh, how do I write? Always now with a pen and paper for a long time on a couch. We have a couch that has this big saggy place in it. That's where my <laughs> butt has been lots of time on that couch. Um, I'm usually got very bad po You would not be pleased. My posture's terrible when I'm writing. So I'm gonna sit up straighter now. Um, and so it's, it's by hand. It's the pen, the paper for a long time. I reluctantly move to the computer. I realize that everything I've read is pretty terrible. I type it up, fix it a little, take it off the computer, keep working it. Um, for me, writing is a song. There's a rhythm and there's a musicality to it. It is why I will never write a bestseller because why? I care so much about the, because I have at times been known to sacrifice the excitement and thrill of a plot, and now I'm talking about novels, for that lush uh, <laughs> moment in the cave of language. I just like being there, well, sorry. you're seduced by words. By the sound of them yeah. and by the meaning of them, yes. Well, there is a lyricism to what you're, but you just mentioned novels. You've written 20 books, <clears throat> and 10 of them are novels. Which do you prefer? I. I prefer the sentence that is working at the time. Um, and so... That's like the artist who, when you ask him what his favorite work is, he says, the one I'll do tomorrow. Yeah, well, that's good. I'm going to use that one, too. Yeah, I'm going with that. I, I, you know what, it's... Do you uh, find one more easy to write than the other? Um, I find it very easy 
to write the first four paragraphs of my Philadelphia Inquirer story. So look at it, Kevin. Um, and then after that, it's really painful because I don't know exactly where I'm going. Why did I start with this impulse? Um, why, did I, why did I decide today that I'm going to talk about Andalusia, um, for example, or and these are pieces that have been published since the book came out. Um, I am not happy unless the, the pieces have opportunities, as my students will tell you, what I'm really, what matters in writing is where does the reader get to enter this piece? Right. So I like writing the essays. I like writing <clears throat> memoir. I find it uh, fraught. Um, I like teaching memoir. But there are many, many novels, and most all of them, there's only one, I think, we were talking about this a little, that doesn't have Philadelphia in it in some way. We, the book, um, which is quite wonderful, and it's called Love, and it's an affair with Philadelphia. But you write, you even wrote, read to us just now about Stone Harbor. You write about lots of areas that are not in, that are suburban. That are not strictly speaking in Philadelphia, right. but they are Philadelphian. They are experiences that most Philadelphians will have. They'll go out to Lancaster. They're, if they're lucky, they'll go up to Hawk Mountain. Um, they will go to the shore, Beach Haven or Stone Harbor, Chanticleer Garden. You know, if you're going to come to Philadelphia, so. What I believe is there are no boundaries, there are no borders. Um, we're the tri-state area. We go in, we come out. If you've been here and you love this place, love of Philadelphia Fair will speak to you. I hope. <laughs> it's, you know, I wonder if you have favorite pieces in, in the book. Which would they be? And, and I'm wondering about what are all of these things that speak to you? Well, look, what is the purpose of writing anything at all, especially if you're writing truth? The, the purpose for me, and you know, when I wrote a memoir about El Salvador, for example, um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a story about that. So I spent uh, 15 years working on a memoir about El Salvador, which is my husband's home. And uh, it was a novel for many years, and then it became a memoir. And when I finally finished it, there was a massive earthquake that, dis earthquake that destroyed the town of Santa Tecla and my husband's um, mother's coffee farm. And all of these things that I had tried to hold on the page with language had been disrupted by you know, tectonic plates. I think, in other words, that that book then, Still Love in Strange Places, holds something for all of time, or as long as we have, we will have as a global um, operation here. Um, language holds things. And that's what I am trying to do, is to hold language in place. I mean, to hold place in right. place with language. You mentioned memoir. Um, tell us the difference between autobiography <laughs> and memoir. I should have my students, David, Sylvia, whoever else is here. Um, the difference in a, in a nutshell is that an autobiography is a strict chronological retelling of a life. It's anecdotal. It doesn't search for meaning. It doesn't make place for the reader to experience their own sort of quest to understand some aspect of life. And memoir, in short, is better. I, <laughs> Only read and buy and write memoir. Thank you very much. Do you have to be totally honest in memoir? You should try to be as honest as you can be. Um, and yet, we all know that memory is, is at fault. What we cannot do <clears throat> is purposely lie. Um, and what we should not do is pretend we know it all. It was, I think it was Mr. Justice Souter, I'm not sure, who was talking about memoir and, and writing it. And he was saying that as I write, the things that I recall with the greatest clarity never happened. <laughs> Well, some in my family would say that <laughs> I try to write as truthfully as I can. All right, what are you writing now? Well, you should know that she blogs almost every day. Now, I don't know how, we ha how you have time to do a life and, and a column and books and to blog every day. Well, my hair doesn't look as good as yours does, most. And um, blogging is I've been, uh, the last six months I have not blogged every day, to be honest. I've blogged more like three or four times a week. Um, and what I'm trying to do there is celebrate 
another person, another person's book. I'm trying to comment on the writing life or the writing process. Um, and I'm trying to activate my <coughs> mind at a very early hour because so much of my life is spent giving away myself. And when I blog, it's a little bit of time for me to say to myself, what do you think today, Beth? Because I'm going to primarily spend the rest of my day listening to what other people think or want. Do you set yourself um, a number of words or so, or it's just what you feel at the moment? No, it could be just, it could be a photograph and a caption, or it could be, 10 paragraphs on pushing the narrative boundaries in young adult literature, or it could be about my disappointment in what is happening mm. in, in, uh, in literature, or it could be H is for Hawk, you have to read it, or it could be M Train, Patti Smith. Is every, how many people in this room got tickets to the Patti Smith? Like, you know, you must have done it within 30 seconds because those, those tickets sold out, and that is the best book. You are so lucky. Just Kids was brilliant, and Train even more so, so. Tell me about your love affair with Bruce Springsteen. Oh! <laughs> shall I sing? No, I, 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 yes. shall I dance? Actually, I'd be better at that. Um, I love this guy. I write about that in the book. I made an excuse. I put him in Citizens Bank Park, so you know. Um, I only got to see him once, though, with this guy here in person, but I've loved Bruce Springsteen because he's gritty, he's authentic. There are so many cool, personal Bruce Springsteen moments where he's been walking down a beach, for example, and seeing someone in distress and shows up five days later at that person's um, nephew's funeral, for example, is one story. But he's real, and he writes with grit, and I can dance to him forever. Have you ever met him? No. Why would that happen? No. <laughs> no. But if you're listening, Bruce, I'm here for you. In, a, in, in just, you know, the appre musical appreciation way. <laughs> I'm looking at my husband's face. I, I always marvel at, at the things Beth sees that I think most of us don't see. I mean, it... it and I'm, I've made all sorts of resolutions to look more carefully in the future. But I'm really wondering how you would write a particular thing. Last Friday, in, when it was storming and it was uh. terrible and it was awful, Beth <laughs> came to see me. <laughs> Beth came to see me from 3rd and Spruce. I'm at 22nd and Pennsylvania Avenue. And she walked all the way in that drenching rain. So and I you, looked so good when I showed up. You did. Uh -huh. <laughs> but if you were to write about that, what were you seeing? What were you thinking while you were walking through that rain? Well, that was a beautiful day, um, despite the fact that I myself wasn't beautiful. Um, but I had started at 3rd and Spruce because I was being interviewed by Ralph Collier's um, widow about love in her home. And it was a beautiful conversation. And then I had the chance to walk up the street far to see you. Far, very but, far. But guess what? In the middle of it, my nephew was texting me. And so do you have to picture that I was, I was drenched? Um, but there's the, the... Very drenched. Yeah. I, I left a little puddle in Marsha Rose's house. Um, but the, the love uh, fountain, the water was all bright pink. And so I stopped in the middle of this rainstorm to take a photograph for my nephew and to send it to him. And so for me, it was exhilarating because I also got to see the uh, knots of intentions that were still there from, right. from the Pope's visit. And I was experiencing this feeling. Just a week ago, the Pope was here. Just a week ago, he was there. Just so that's what I was thinking. Are you going to write about it? I wrote a little bit on the blog about it, um, not that feeling. You would be surprised at how much I, I think about and don't write about, so no. You know why I wouldn't write about that? Because I would feel that I would need and I should properly get your permission and, and you know, because if I'm going to be writing in a specific way about an experience with someone, so no. Is, is, the, is there a next novel underway? 
there are two novels underway, and, um, and I like them both. And one is very strange, and one is very r relevant right now. Can you write both at the same time, or no. you just think them both? No, the one I worked on for two years, and then I've set it aside, and then I had a burst where I wrote something else. Um, and I am just in a place of um, allowing things to sink in. The thing that people always say, oh, Beth, you're so prolific. And the thing is that... But you are. But, but six months out of every year, I don't really write except for the essays and for the Chicago Tribune and the blog. I'm not writing books at that time. But you're writing. You are constantly writing. And, and, and uh, 20 books is a lot of books. Yeah, some people think so. <laughs> but you know what? I haven't written the perfect book yet, so why not keep trying? I, I'm going to... Um, there was a... I don't know if many of you, show hands, read Beth's column in Sunday's Inquirer. Well, <laughs> Kevin not, did. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not in the book, so we'll, you'll have to... Um, I have it on Google, my lap. Google and get it. But I loved it. I mean, I, I love a lot of things. And I just, um, so having talked about not reading things, I'm just going to, May, do I have your permission? Sure. <laughs> the, I'm going to sit be, back. Because this, um, this thing really, in a way, I think, sums up one of the things Beth does. She's talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, having to close up uh, her father's house and, and for them to move on. And she says, Leaving takes a while. Leaving required my father and me to dig through 40 years of history, to unearth letters, to shake bookmarks free, to unhook the paintings from the walls, to photograph the big and the little things. Leaving required us to consider Christmas pasts and piano, beach music, piano bench music, to choose just a handful of orchids for keeping, to dust the old Regina music box, for the sake of posterity. Leaving required us to step away, make room for the big for sale sign, entrust the realtors with the keys. I, that's an experience that many of us have had already or will at one time. And it's really very mundane and very prosaic, but you make it very poetic and you touch all those chords of memory. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought that was wonderful. Well, thanks. Um, I think it's something we all do, but it's so huge. And there is an example of a universal experience that in order to make it relevant, to, there's a very interesting balance between choosing enough particular detail and enough uh, sort of accordion space for universal uh, experience for the, for the reader. And um, that piece meant a lot, right, Dad? We, we worked very hard this summer on our house, on your house. So. And letting go is hard to do. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do. And I think you captured that. I mean, well, for, for most of us, uh, things matter. And you make things matter, but in an ephemeral way. So well, that's, that's... Well, you've yeah. done a lot of making things matter in your life. And you wrote for the Enquirer, and you were a national broadcasting star. So let me reverse this a little <laughs> bit and ask you, what mattered to you as you looked out? Marsha Rose, you should know, has the most extraordinary view of the city of probably anybody, right? Your apartment. And uh, you get to watch the city in storm and sun, in moonlight. I know you're up till 3 in the morning, so lots of moonlight. Um, what do you see in this city? Oh, I, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm having trouble with, I see lots of things, and um, I've, I've watched the city grow. I mean, it's really very interesting, because we've been living there for many, many years, and I've seen, for a long time, Philadelphia's skyscraper was, was um, dull and mediocre and uninteresting, and part of that was because the rules, the zoning rules were such that you couldn't go up, you went out and up to the building line, and it was really pretty dull. And then it all really began to change, maybe in about 79 or so. Um, and um, with all this new building surge, and so we could watch all of these things going up at one time, and, 
and being basically a dinosaur, I didn't think I wanted things to change. I mean, it was, it was okay, it was benign, and, but um, the, the energy that was released by all of these new buildings, and it was, and you know, somebody said, if you, if you, don't, uh, if you don't change, you don't grow, uh, was true. So I've, I've watched that, and that's been very exciting. You know, Adam Gopnik, for those of you who love cities, um, and Adam Gopnik in last week's New Yorker did an extraordinary job of looking. Did you, did you see that? I didn't see it. So Google it and read it. He really looks at that very delicate point of if, if, if a city is growing too much, it's going to exclude those ultimately because it's going to grow and, and become richer. Those who have lived it and enjoyed it, if it begins to fail, their the lives of those who have been around the city for a long time failed too. So he's looking at a series of books like the new one on Detroit and I thought it as a brilliant piece of writing about the necessary dynamic of growth but stability that marks a city. Philadelphia is in the prime, right? Because when I lived here, when I graduated from Penn, it was lonely there then too. I remember walking Market Street on a Sunday and finding just like you know, trash, like in my, blowing Absolutely. in my face. I mean, it was just like a bowling alley and nobody was playing the game. And, and it's really interesting to see that we are now on the top of so many lists. You know, the Urban Park, the New York Times named Philadelphia this year the best um, destination, travel destination in the United States and third in the world. Um, so many things that have been happening for the city. And I think we cannot help but take a lot of pride do and I, I mean, we become boosters. I mean, I, our, growing up, our son once said that he thought that Philadelphia was America's best kept secret, but that isn't true anymore. And I think the change came. I mean, I was thinking about it. I think the change came when the Philadelphia Museum of Art did the Cezanne show. Hmm. And for the first time in a long time, the New York Times started writing about us. Hmm. And, um, and you see the people on the streets and the changes, and it's, it's very exciting. You get to watch Beyonce and JC from up there. You I try not to listen. <laughs> <laughs> but you interviewed Marsha Rose. Um, by the way, I don't know if we, if we said this, but she often outpaced Walter Cronkite in the ratings. So you got to interview a number of people across the world. You were in China, you did all these things. But Philadelphians, if you were to name a few Philadelphians who made a difference that you loved talking to during your broadcast years, that's a tough question. I see. I can ask you. <laughs> I can ask you that. I don't know. I um, Ed Rendell, because he. I mean, the energy and the love for the city and the vision, all of that, w was was very special. Um, what I'm going to do is beg off on the other two because I got a very discreet signal from Jason that says that um, we can take questions from the audience. But only, but only easy ones. So um, what we're going to do is, uh, if you'll raise your hand, and I'll recognize you, well, I'll try to, and we have people with microphones, please don't ask your question until uh, you're given the microphone because um, Everybody else can't hear it, and it also won't record for the podcast. All right, I'll take questions. No, uh, I don't believe it. There's one right. brave man. So uh, I was wondering, <clears throat> I'm a lifelong uh, Philadelphia resident, and uh, I think our relationships to our sports teams is <laughs> different than, it, than in other cities. Do you have any thoughts about that? We are brutal, right? <laughs> we're pretty brutal. Um, we love them when we're up and we're angry. We don't give them a lot of room when they're down. Um, but you know what? Philadelphia writers are treated the same way. Um, we are a city that has a really, I think, weirdly difficult time loving our own in times of trouble. Um, so, uh, I happened to be there when the Phillies won the World Series many, many years ago because my father got us tickets along the first baseline and I was, I was doing homework from Penn at the time. Um, and, you know, oh, but we, 
I think we struggle to love as much as we should here in the city or to be as accommodating or as understanding of the transitions that sports teams go through as they are rebuilding themselves. Um, but do we put a lot of flair and passion into our feelings? Yes, we do. We can yell louder than anybody. More hands. There's one up there. You know, um, whenever I used to give a, a, a speech and, and at the end we would say we'll take questions, I asked the person who had organized it to get three people to ask the first three questions. And I said, I don't, I don't want to know what they were, but I just... You need somebody to ask those first three questions, and then the torrent starts. Or, or you could go home early. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Neil Pratt. It's a pleasure to listen to you today. I Thanks. moved here uh, a year and two days ago from Georgia, <laughs> and uh, I came on a solo trip just to see the city because it was an abyss in my mind. Like all I knew was the name, and that was it. Can you, can you move the mic back or forward or something? It's a little bit garbled up okay, here. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. Sorry Thank about you. that. I was saying that I moved here a year, a year and two days ago. Much better, um, thanks. After visiting this city for just three days, and I felt an energy here, and surprisingly it was in East Market, you know, just Market Street between City Hall and Independence Hall. I fell in love with that. And I've only been here for a year, and I've never tra traveled outside Center City except huh. long expanses. So what should I see huh. outside of the Center City limits, you know, bikeable or trainable, you know? Oh, well, I think that there's such a, a geological and geographical uh, variety of things that you could see. So um, in the book, I talk about, for example, Hawk Mountain, uh, where you can climb, uh, you know, up a, a gradual slope and then a very uh, steep one to, and just lie out there with bird watchers and count, you know, eagles and hawks. And it's really quite an experience. You've got to go out to Lancaster, of course, and go to, to places like Paradise, you know. They actually call things like that there. Um, and just take a different um, measure, a different rhythm. You have to see the shore. And if you love gardens, we do have one of the world's most extraordinary pleasure gardens right outside Philadelphia called Chanticleer. And I write about that in the book as well. So, um, but there are fringes within Philadelphia. I just, I keep discovering the city. Um, for example, with the Fairmount Waterworks, I do uh, volunteer teaching with the kids there. And this year we went up to Andalusia on the Delaware River. It's like stepping, it, it's Nicholas Biddle's uh, former estate. I highly recommend, that's something you'd have to get an Uber to, I think, but you, it is like being in the 18th century. I mean, in the, yeah, the, yeah. Um, it's just remarkable. Everything is preserved. It's extraordinarily quiet. And you can completely imagine what it would have been like to live there um, and to, to bathe there. So there are fringes all, um, you know. Tell them about not a fringe, but the Reading Terminal Market, which is something I'm sure you you've love. done that. Yeah. Have you? Yeah, the Reading Market. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot in this book that is, it's, there's a <clears throat> section called Fringe Work, so that's what I'm really talking about there. More hands. Right in the back. Other. Have, have you seen a difference or an evolution in the way Penn students view, view the city? over the years you've been there? Because I'm sure the vast majority of them are not from the area or from you know, maybe outside the country, certainly outside the region. Well, I've been teaching there since 2009. Um, of course, I had, you know, I was there as a student. I, th I think, I happen to think that the students t today at Penn are far more interesting than the students when I was there. They, they're, they're bringing um, an international flair, and if not that, they're bringing, like David, who's sitting here, a different experience of Philadelphia into the classroom. They're also going out a lot. They're out at the restaurants. They're out um, uh, interviewing people. They're doing a lot of sort of documentary work because that's where their teachers send them. So Philadelphia is a canvas for the Philadelphia students in a way that I certainly myself did not experience. 
in terms of directed by faculty when I was at Penn. I experienced it completely on my own, walking places where I probably had no business walking. Um, but I would say that the students I have the privilege of working with, and it's a small sample, I teach a, a workshop, you know, um, are very alert and alive to the possibilities of the city. So I see yes, another wait. hand back there, and then there's one here. Hello. Um, can you talk about your family background in Philadelphia and your, your family ties to the, the city and the region? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my opening, my mother's mother, uh, her home was at 6840 Geyer Avenue in southwest Philadelphia. So my mother, in my mind, was always the Philadelphian. Um, and my father moved all over in his life, um, and, but settled here because he fell madly in love with my mother. Um, and so we were brought into the city or, you know, spent a lot of time in the city because my grandmother and my beloved uncle um, were, were there in that row house. And, um, and so that was really my start there. And then I've always stayed in the area. I lived um, you know, in Philadelphia when I went to Penn, but then after Penn, I lived in various places. And I continue to come in and out as a teacher, as with my job, writing for the Enquirer, whatever it is. Um, so. But I married, as I said, a Salvadoran, and um, I think what's really important in writing pieces like this, it's given me um, an advantage to have a sort of a distance where I can come in. Every time I take a train ride, it's something new. There's a new piece of graffiti that I see. There's something new happening at 30th Street, or if I go down to you know, Jefferson. Um, and so I, I have a very elastic relationship. And that is why I think I'm able to see the city um, as if it is new all the time. There are people in this room, like the great Nathaniel Popkin over there, who are, I mean, he is Philadelphia's great um, expert, you know, he knows what happens under the manhole covers and has um, written the, the work with Sam Katz, the films and many other things about Philadelphia. My work and my writing is experiential um, and, you know, history based, uh, but experiential. And I know right there, there was a, a question up in the front. Everything's on this side. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy with that. <clears throat> Hi, Beth. I have two questions, so you can pick which one you want. Could you put the mic closer? Sure. Thanks. Um, one is, with 20 books to your name, or roughly, um, have you ever had a crisis of confidence in your writing, or just hit a really big wall, and how did you get out of that? Good if question. I, I can answer that one. I like that one. Okay. You want me to start with that one? Sure. Uh, I have a crisis of confidence almost every day um, when I'm writing. When I'm not writing, I have a crisis of confidence because I'm not writing. Um, but I think it's really hard, and I know that you are a really talented writer. I think that it is, uh, it's very difficult to believe that what you're saying is going to matter to anybody. That's the greatest uh, challenge I have. And the way that I get past that is to remind myself how much genuine, authentic pleasure I am taking from the making of something, whether or not it ever gets published, is read, if it is published and the critics hate it, whatever it is. I was exercising my soul, my small capacities, uh, my sense of rhythm and dance on the page. And that is what is making me human in the moment. So I always have to go uh, step aside. And there's a, such a huge difference between being a writer and being a published author. And the only real pleasure is being a writer. So that's how I get past that. It's a great answer and a good question. <laughs> Did you have another question? Well, the other question is um, your, your writing is so poetic, and I'm wondering if uh, poetry, if there are poets who directly affected your writing or if it sort of came through 
just sort of naturally through other, other people's prose. Well, thank you. And the answer is that my degree from Penn is in the history and sociology of science. And I wasn't really exposed to any writer. The first writer I ever saw in person, I was 31 years old, uh, Fabian Nigg. Um, first time I ever saw a writer. Um, and all of, I am very much self taught. Um, but over time, you know, I wrote poetry, not really knowing what it was from the time I was about nine. Um, and now there are poets whose work. Uh, like Stanley Kunitz, uh, like Gerald Stern, like Jack Gilbert, uh, like this, the glorious simplicity of Mary Oliver, um, that actually there was a time when I, for many, many years, I suffered from very terrible migraine headaches. And I found out that the cure was reading Gerald Stern poetry. I don't know why. But yeah. I would be able to read. Did, did you ever tell him that? Yeah, I had a chance to... to profile him actually for a magazine story and I did tell him that um, there's something about the way his language works that would unlock the pain in my brain so um, yeah I need I need poetry and, and I learn from those who are true poets we have ch time for one more question yes sir with the hat right there I'm curious I'm going to ask you it specifically this way because I'm from New York. I've Mike, been, closer to you. I'm please. from New York and I've been here since 1970. And I've come to know and love Philadelphia, but I cannot find it wonderful in just its appearance. I mean, there's a lot that's just, even the new uh, construction around Penn. A lot of it is just ugly. Uh, but what I want to ask you is, when you go to New York, I mean, my feeling about you from what I've heard is you would be the same no matter where you were living. My question to you is, when you go to New York and you are on the streets, yeah. what happens to you? You know, you go wild? I think I think that you have pegged me as someone who falls precipitously in love, um, married and very happily married only once for thirty years. But in life, yeah, do I walk around and say, oh, "This is cool"? How many text messages or phone calls from my husband will get from me wherever I am? Just like, this is electric. This is cool. So yes. If the question is, had I been born in New York, would I have written a love letter to New York? I think I'm, I'm, I'm physiologically predisposed to looking at the landscape, to finding out what works in it. There are a lot of, you know, here's a, here's a fallacy. The fallacy is, if I'm very critical about something, then I'm smarter than other people. Right? I've lived that. I've, because I'm, I'm the other side. I can't be as smart as other people because I love. I, uh, I'm so old now that I'm just going to say I don't believe that anymore. So the, the question is, yeah, I get excited about New York. I get excited about Krakow. I get excited about Seville. Um, and I, I, am, I lack, perhaps, the, my, I'm more porous visually and physically than maybe others are. If that's a good thing or a bad thing, whatever it is, that's who I am. So, I'm, I'm getting all sorts of signals that say that our time is up, which is really, really too bad. I, I'm going to ask a question because I are you going to be signing books upstairs? Yes. All right, so please, and, and, and talking to people, yeah. which is wonderful. Beth's book is Love, a Philadelphia Affair, and it's, and it's wonderful. And it made me think, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, and you know what chauvinist people we are. And, and I fell in love with Philadelphia. It wasn't love at first sight, but but it is a wonderful city, and and she is a remarkable writer, and uh, we thank you, Beth. Thank you so much, Marsha Rose, for doing this. <laughs>